Today's message is entitled, God's Testimony, because it really is all about God and what he did for a man like me. To give you a little of my background, my father is a Roman Catholic, my mother a Methodist Sunday School teacher, my brother an elder in the Mormon Church, and I went to the Baptist Bible Schools. So I had a lot of churchianity as I was growing up. But I really didn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now the Lord knocks at the door of our heart many times, and he always brings people into our lives, puts us into situations that we might seek him and make him a part of our lives. And uh, I know he did that to me several times, um, but unfortunately I was very busy chasing the world, wanting to please my five senses. I was smoking, eating, drinking, doing drugs, and uh, I actually had an overdose of the drugs. And I thought I was going to die. And uh, I got scared. I went back into my bedroom. I pulled open the bottom drawer beside my bed. And I took out a Bible. And I laid there on the bed, staring at the ceiling. I knew I was dying. My system was shutting down. And as my eyes got heavier and heavier, I had one last thought, one last prayer. God, if you're real, if there really is a God, there really is a heaven, let me live to see the morning sun. But if there's no God, no heaven, no angels, and all of this is a lie, then I will just die tonight, and it won't make any difference. But if by chance you're real, and you let me live to see the morning sun, I promise to find you. My eyes finally closed for what I thought would be the very last time. I was unconscious for hours, and then I awoke. I still had this Bible against my chest. And friends, I believe the reason I'm standing here today is because of the power that this book represents. As I began to gather my thoughts, I remember that last prayer, God, if you're real, let me live to see the morning sun. I reached behind me where the curtains were, I pulled them across, and sunlight shot across the room. And it was like the glory of God filled that whole room. I began to laugh and cry at the same time. I said, God, you're real. There really is a heaven. There really are angels. You've let me live to see the morning sun, and now I'm going to find you. So I went out into the living room, and I opened up the telephone book under the churches because I didn't know where else to look. And every Sunday, I would go to a different church. I would sit in the back, and I would listen 20 minutes, 30. Nope, God is not here. And I would get up, and I would walk out. Every week, I was scratching them out of the phone book. Every month, I was scratching them out of the phone book. Finally, one day, I came home to the condominium that I lived, and I saw there was a brochure on everybody's door except mine. So I went to the neighbor, and I stole his, and I was looking at it. And this was a four-color run brochure. This was expensive. This wasn't the corner church Xeroxing off an announcement. This was part of a big chain, a franchise of a denomination. So I called them up to find out which one they were, because I'd already eliminated two months' worth from the phone book, and I didn't want to repeat myself. So I said, what church are you? She said, we're just a God-fearing church. I said, well, of course. You all say that. I'm checking you out. You're not checking me out. <laughs> I want to know what church you are. Why don't you come one night to the crusade? If you don't like it, Never have to come back again. Are you Jehovah's Witnesses? No, I'll come. <laughs> and so I went, and I sat in the back, expecting to walk out in another 20 or 30 minutes. But for the first time, this evangelist was opening up the Bible, and he was allowing the Bible to explain itself. Amen. Everywhere he went, Old Testament, New Testament, he was letting the Bible explain itself. This was good. 30 minutes went by. An hour, two hours, I came back the next night, and the next, and the next. It was the beginning of a five-week crusade. By the third week, I was halfway up the front. This was good. And on that fifth and final week, I was on the very front row. Pen and paper flying everywhere. I couldn't believe what I was learning. This was so clear, so solid, right from the Bible. But on that last week, he brought up a subject I could not accept. 
I knew he was wrong. I had proof. And I was angry with God. Why did you take me through four and a half weeks of clear truth, and now in the last week, he blew it? He was wrong. Now, for you to understand why I would not accept what he said, I have to take you back a couple of years to my senior year of high school. I went to a school of about 900 students. Beginning of every school year, all of us guys were walking around on our tiptoes looking over the new girls that came up over the summertime. <laughs> and I remember walking up the north hallway and a young girl walking toward me with long brown hair, bright blue eyes, spring in her step, and a sparkle on her face. And as soon as she passed, I followed. <laughs> I wrote down her class number. I ran back to my class. At the end of the period, I ran back where she was, and I wrote down her next number. And in two days, I had her whole schedule. But how am I going to meet her? I'm very shy. And so finally, a friend of mine said, I think I know who you're talking about. And I said, show me. She said, is that her? And I said, yes, introduce me. Chris McDaniel. So a couple of weeks went by. I built up my courage, and I asked her out for a date. And she said, no. <laughs> I said, that's OK. She knows my name. A few more weeks went by. I built up my courage again. I asked her out a second time. And she said, uh, you know the feeling. <laughs> a few more weeks went by. I asked her out a third time. And she said, yeah. no. <laughs> Strike three, you're out. But a couple of days later, the girl who introduced us said, hey, I hear you've been asking that Chris McDonald girl out. And I said, oh, man, don't tell anybody. I'm so embarrassed. I got the picture. She doesn't want to go out. She said, you know what you're doing wrong? What do you mean? Well, you keep asking her for that coming weekend. I said, yeah. Every guy on campus is asking her out. You need to ask farther ahead. She's booked. I said, no, I can't ask her again. I'm too embarrassed. Three times, that's enough. Ask her one more time, farther ahead. Are you sure? We girls talk. So I ran home, and I got my calendar, and I opened it up, and I picked something one month away, November 11. So I went to school, and I saw Chris, and I said, Chris, there's this big event on November 11. And I thought, maybe if you weren't busy, we could go out. And she said, yes. yes. I got a hold of another couple, and I said, Mickey and Sheila, you got to go, go with us, because I don't know what to say, and I don't want to talk about, and I don't want to talk, because I don't have all the talking, so you can help me, you can talk some of the time. They said, yes, Paul, we'll go with you. Calm down. I had one month to get ready. The day arrives, November 11. I'm so excited. It's an all-day event. At noon, we go to a restaurant to get something to eat. As soon as I pull into the parking lot, Mickey and Sheila, the other couple, they jump out of the car, and they begin to race to see who could get to the restaurant first. Well, I saw what they were doing, so I jumped out quickly, and I started running to catch up to them. And then I realized Chris was still back at the car. <laughs> so I yelled, come on, Chris, hurry up. And she started running as fast as she could, and I held out my hand. And she slipped her little hand into mine, and my feet did not touch the ground the rest of the day. And yes, five months later, we went to the prom. This was my senior year. She was two years behind me. Now I was graduating, and I was going away to college. We decided to keep a long-distance relationship. And she said, you know, next year, um, I'm eligible to try out for cheerleading. Do you mind if I try? No, go ahead. Why not? Well, some guys don't want their girls to be cheerleaders. You guys know what cheerleaders are? Yeah. They go to a sporting event and they rah, rah. Yeah, OK. So I said, sure, go ahead and try out. Um, we only have six varsity cheerleaders, 900 students. So she tried out, and she made the squad. She became one of our varsity cheerleaders. So I went away to college. I came back home at Christmas time. We spent the holidays together. Then I left the state to go back to college. 
Then I flew back home for the summer. We spent the summer together. Now this was her last year of high school. And uh, she got accepted full scholarship at a private university. She was very intelligent. And uh, she said, uh, is it OK if I try out for cheerleading again? And I said, of course. And she did. And this time, she not only made the squad, she became the captain, our head varsity cheerleader. Now, every year, we send our head cheerleader to a camp in California, where thousands of girls come from all over the country to order their new uniforms, to learn their new yells and their jumps and their flips. So she went as our captain to the camp. I went back to college. Christmas time, I came home. And we were walking down the hallway together, and we passed by the big trophy case where all the awards and the banners were. And I was looking at them, and inside there was a gold baton laying down. And her name was engraved on that baton. And I said, Chris, what is your name doing on this baton? And she said, oh, that's nothing. Let's go. And I said, no, how come, how come your name? What is this for? She said, really, it's nothing at all. Please, let's go. So I grabbed one of the other students. And I said, how come her name is on this baton? And they said, well, didn't you know she went to cheerleading camp this year? I said, yeah, she's our head cheerleader. Well, it was at the camp that she was voted the most outstanding cheerleader in the United States. And she never told me that, because she, she was a very quiet, humble girl. So I flew back to college, and I realized that this was the girl that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, that I wanted her to be the mother of my children. In fact, I had the names of the first two already selected. <laughs> if it was a boy, he would be Christopher Michael. If it was a girl, she would be Christine Michelle. The next boy would be named Robert James, and then she could name all the rest. Well, I flew back to college. It was uh, the first week in March. I was preparing for some final exams. And the phone rang from a friend back home in Alaska. We talked for a few moments. And then she said, has anybody from up here called you in the last 24 hours? And I said, no, did something happen? She said, there was an accident. And I said, Chris is all right, isn't she? She began to cry. There was a tournament last night, and three of our cheerleaders were riding home with one of the athletes. And there was a drunk driver and a head-on collision. And I said, but Chris is all right. She wasn't in the car, was she? And she began to cry some more. She said, Gloria and Cheryl are dead. And I'm sorry to tell you, Chris died last night. And I said, no, you have to take her to the hospital. The doctors can help her. You can't let her die. I'll never get to hold little Christine in my arms. I'll never get to see my Robbie boy grow up because some young person decided they can drink and drive. <coughs> and three girls never got to graduate. Three girls never got to have families because one person decided they could drink and drive. I flew home. I went to the funeral of the three girls. When the funerals were over, my parents asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, nothing. I have no more plans. I have no more future. I dropped out of college. I flew down to Arizona to stay with some friends. I was there for about two weeks, and I was awakened in the middle of the night. There was a pink, swirling light that filled the room. I sat up in bed to look around to see where this was coming from, and then suddenly in the corner, a round white ball of light appeared. And I rubbed my eyes, and I looked again, and this round white ball of light began to move to the very center of the room. When it stopped, it began to get larger, and a silver light began to move up and down, and it took shape, and suddenly, there was Chris. I was so happy. 
I remember walking across the cold floor in my bare feet. I put my arms around her waist. She put her arms around my neck. She kissed me here. And she said, please, don't cry anymore. I'm all right. We died so suddenly in the car accident. God gave us special permission to come back to the earth to say goodbye to our loved ones. All three cheerleaders made numerous visits to family and friends with the same message. We died so suddenly, we were allowed to come back and say goodbye. And now three years later, I'm sitting on the front row of this crusade, and this preacher is opening the Bible, and he's trying to tell me the dead know not anything. And I said, preacher, you know not anything. <laughs> and I have proof. And so do a lot of other people. But everywhere he went, he showed that when the people die, they sleep. Over 45 times this message is said in scripture, especially in Chronicles. When the kings died, they slept with their fathers. They slept with their fathers. When Lazarus died, Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. And so I had a struggle. I had a decision to make. Do I choose the word of God or my own experience? Satan knew that if I chose my experience, he had me. Because I would have no book to take me through this life. And so I prayed and I struggled and I realized that that was not Chris who came to visit me. She was supposed to have gotten baptized the end of March, but on March 6th, she took her rest in Jesus. But I'm looking forward to that resurrection morning when just like on our first date, I'm going to hold out my hand. She's going to slip her hand into mine and our feet won't touch the ground. Now, I'm looking forward to that morning, as I know many of you are also. I've been to every one of her high school reunions because I knew all of her classmates. And at her 30-year reunion, they decided to do something very different. The director contacted me, and she said, Paul, we're planning the 30-year reunion and we're going to do something special. We're going to go to the grave sites of every one of the three cheerleaders. And I want you to speak at Chris's grave because some of her classmates are not saved and we want them to be saved. So will you speak? I said, I, I don't know if I can do that. Yes, you can, we're praying for you. Please talk to her classmates. And so a couple of days, I said, all right, I would do that. So we were at the cemetery, and her classmates were gathered together there. And I spoke to them. I said, you know, this is the 30-year reunion. Chris is asleep right now, but she's going to come up on that resurrection morning for a reunion like no other reunion we have been to. Jesus is coming back. And Chris would like nothing more when she comes up to see every one of your faces again in the kingdom of heaven. And there'll be no more funerals. There'll be no more reunions because we will be together forever. Every one of her classmates were given a Steps to Christ. And so I was able to preach one last sermon for Chris to her classmates. That was a privilege. Well, <laughs> I studied, I prayed, and I received the most important document that I possess. Of all the awards and recognitions I've received in my life, this is the most important document that I possess. It is my baptismal certificate. Amen. On the back of this are 13 vows, 13 promises that I made to God. Now, I haven't finished these yet, but I'm on my way. And I'll get back to this in just a few moments. Well, 
After my baptism, about six months after my baptism, I went back home to Alaska, and my parents had a lot of questions. Why another church in our house? And why Seventh-day Adventist? It's a good question. It's a fair question. One that I might ask some of you this morning. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I have two reasons. Number one, it has given me the clearest picture of God and his character according to the Bible. If you have a clearer picture of God and his character, you have my undivided attention. I want to know God. The second reason why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is because it has brought the power of the Holy Spirit into my life to help me be the Christian man that God wants me to be. If you can help me have more of this Holy Spirit, I'm listening. I want to be God's man in these last days. Well, as a new Adventist, I told the Lord, I'm not really sure about these people because I don't know them well. So I'm going to give you a test before I start telling everybody what I have learned. Gideon gave you a test. It's my turn. Here's the test. I'm going to share this truth with four people, my grandparents and two sisters that I went to high school with. If this is true, I want all four baptized in one year. If it's not true, don't let them accept it, and I will keep searching. But you know what happened within one year. All four were baptized. And I said, Lord, that's pretty good. You passed the test. But Gideon tested you twice, so I want one more test, and then I promise no more. Here's the test. I want someone from another denomination, another church, tell me I have found Jesus as an Adventist. Would you do that? He did it several times, but I'll share this one story. It was Christmas time. I was working at a very expensive clothing store in Anchorage. Our clients were lawyers, politicians, doctors, very wealthy people. And now that I was a new Adventist, I didn't like cigarette smoke. And they allowed smoking back in the 70s. And so when a customer would come in smoking, I'd ask him to put it on the ashtray, and I would slide the cigarette in the ashtray away from me. This lady came in. She was smoking. I said, would you mind putting that on the ashtray? She said, no. And I slid the ashtray and the cigarette out of way. She said, cigarette smoke must bother you. I said, yes, I understand it will kill you. And she laughed. She said, well, I take it you don't smoke. And I said, no, but I used to do a lot of foolish things. I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to eat dead animals. I used to take drugs. I used to smoke. I said, I did everything. She said, really? I said, yes, but my whole life has changed now. I said, uh, I am, I'm, a, I'm a vegetarian. Um, I get to bed at midnight, which was good for me back then. Remember, God takes us a step at a time. I said, I don't drink anything that bubbles. I don't eat anything that goes to the bathroom. I said, my whole life is different. And she said, really? Could I ask you a personal question? Sure, go ahead. She looked around. <clears throat> Are you a Christian? <laughs> yes, I'm a born-again, baptized Seventh-day Adventist. I am so excited about my walk with God. I'm understanding the Bible for the first time. I'm having wonderful fellowship with my brothers and sisters on Wednesday night prayer meeting, Friday night vespers, Saturday all day at church. And she said, really? And I said, yes. And I told her that my father was a Catholic, my mother was a Methodist, my brother was a Mormon, I went to Baptist Bible school. But now I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, I have to ask you another question. What's that? Why did you leave the Mother Church? Oh. Now I know I'm speaking to a Catholic. What does a baby Adventist tell a Roman Catholic? Hmm. The beast! No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I said, there are some things I've discovered in the Bible that don't agree with what they teach in Catholicism. She said, like what? Well, the Bible says you should call no man father, except your father which is in heaven. She said, what else? I said, a priest can't say, ego te absolvo, and forgive me of my sins. Only Jesus forgives me of my sins. Amen. She said, what else? So I talked with her for another half hour. And she said, Paul, 
you have been so open and honest with me. It is my turn now to share with you. And I said, okay. Turns out she was visiting for the Christmas holidays. She was from Europe, Italy, Vatican City. Paul, I'm the most powerful woman in all of Roman Catholicism. I serve on the National Council of Judaica at the Vatican, and I teach the Roman Catholic priests at the Gregorian Pacific Pontifical University. And I want to tell you something. You know God. The wisdom you have shared with me this past hour together is far beyond your young years to have acquired. You have had an encounter with the Almighty. I would love to take you back to the Vatican with me. I said, oh, I'm a Protestant. <laughs> she says, no, I want my priests to meet you. I want them to see what it looks like when someone has really encountered God. Paul, you have found a very precious truth. Don't ever leave it. I can tell by your boldness and your excitement that God is going to put you up front, on the front lines. Little did I know how prophetic her statement was. Because according to my frequent flyer with the airlines, I have already flown 500,000 miles. And I'm not finished. She said, Paul, back at the Vatican, I call none of the Monsignor's father. I call them by their first name. I call no man father. And when I kneel to sleep at night, I also ask Jesus to forgive me, because you're right. No priest has the authority to forgive. And I said, I don't understand. She said, listen carefully. You go and do the work that God has told you to do. I believe I can do more for the kingdom of God, working quietly behind the scene for now. But one day, I will have to take my stand. And when I do, I will join you. Amen. Now, she is still out there waiting, along with the rest of God's people, the majority of God's people, the remnant. You know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for you and I to fall so hopelessly in love with God that when they come in, they don't hear the gossip, the criticizing, the compromise, the low standards. They see Jesus high and lifted up. And we're told when that remnant comes together, because there are many born-again, saved Christians in all churches, I know because I speak in them. I speak in almost more Sunday churches than I do Adventists. They're hard to get into. I'm telling you the truth. And when they come in, we're told that many of us are going out. Brothers and sisters, that means you or the person sitting next to you may be gone in the next couple of years, myself included, if we don't stay focused on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, I've discovered in my travels, and I've been to over 40, actually, this is my 42nd country, in over 42 countries, I have discovered there are about uh, four groups of Adventists in every church. You can spot them very quickly. Just listen to them, watch them. There are Badventists, there are Madventists, there are Sadventists, and then there's that little group called the Gladventists. Now, how do you become a Gladventist? How do you stay a Gladventist? I found there were three things most critical for me. Number one to being a Gladventist is a daily devotional life. This book will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from this book. A Bible that's falling apart belongs to a person who is not falling apart. Daily devotion, Bible study and prayer, number one to be a Gladventist. Number two, you need to tell somebody what you got from this. You need to be a witness, a missionary. And number three, I needed to learn how 
to take care of this body. This is sacred ground. It does not belong to me. It's on loan from God to take care of. And I needed to learn how to do it. And I didn't know. But scripture told me. And now the medical science agrees with over 95% of what God had said. Did you know that? When I first started doing this in the 70s, it was difficult. Even other schools were arguing with me that should not have been arguing with me because they should have read the spirit of prophecy and knew that I was correct. These are not my ideas. These are God's ideas. I'm simply repeating them. I'm simply making them available. So I had to learn how to take better care of myself. And this afternoon, we're going to spend some time doing that. My time with you here is extremely short. And so I'm sorry we didn't have more time to be able to develop this. My health seminars are six hours long. They take three nights. I'll be doing it in Aachen. I'll be doing it in Munich. I'll be doing it again in Würzburg. But the time here is just a small window. So you can watch some of the presentations on YouTube. And so that might be a blessing for you. Um, when I started making these changes, my mother was very upset because she's a nurse. And I had eliminated all meat and all dairy products. And she said, son, you've taken out two of the four food groups. And I said, no, I've taken out two of the toxic groups. I said, I still have four food groups, fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables, just like God gave us. Now I realize some Adventists have five food groups. It's called dessert. <laughs> you need to stop that. <laughs> well, I started making these changes and my health started to improve. I was invited to go to London to speak at Oxford, Cambridge, and the University of London. As soon as I arrived, a very famous medical center found out about me, and they rang me on the telly. And they said, Mr. Vogue, is it true you've been a vegan for 10 years? <laughs> and I said, yes. Oh, good. We want you to come down for some testing. And I said, why? Because we've never had a 10-year vegan, and we want to find out what you're on about. And I said, OK. So I went down. They said, put your runners on and some shorts, and we're going to put you on a machine with six electrodes, and we're going to monitor you and find out who you are. So I took the test, and this paper is the result of that test. You can see the name of the center is uh, Anton Hall. Royalty from Europe, go here. Kings, queens, dukes, duchesses. In fact, an African king was there while I was there. When you arrive at Heathrow Airport, they pick you up in a Jaguar. And that gives you the idea of their clients. They grow most of all of the food that they serve you at this resort. So this document was completed, and they looked at it, and they kept shaking their head. And they said, uh, this is impossible. And I said, what do you mean? They said, your result was high category of fitness. And I said, good. And they said, no, only Olympic athletes can do this. And I said, really? They said, you got to train six or eight hours a day to accomplish this. You don't train that much. And I said, no, I don't. They said, to do this, you have to be the best of the best. And I said, OK. <laughs> and they said, you're too old to do this. When I took this test, I was 35 years old. Two weeks ago, I turned 67 years old. Almost 70 years old. But I don't feel like it. Because you're as young as your attitude and your arteries. And we'll talk about that a little bit this afternoon. The doctors are amazed when they run tests on me. They said, you're 20, 30 years younger than what your documents tell us. <laughs> it's not possible. It is if you follow God's program. You get to stay younger, longer. I started this when I was 23, and I never got out of my 20s. That's where I'm staying. I'm not going out of my 20s. 
Who wants to be 70? Not me. <laughs> now, part of the problem in my family was we had a lot of junk food in our house. How many of you have junk food in your house? I can come and look if you're not sure. <laughs> the problem was my dad's profession. My dad is a keg decorator. Sh grease and sugar, yeah. My dad is actually a very famous keg decorator. He has decorated cakes for four American presidents. Here are two of his presidential cakes. The top one was President Eisenhower. And that's my father decorating John F. Kennedy. He also did President Truman and President Johnson. Every five years in Germany, they have the World Decorating Contest. And my father won the gold medal, recognizing him as the number one cake decorator in the world. In 1976, America was 200 years old. The state of California asked my father to make the biggest birthday cake in the world. And this three-story, 35,000-pound cake was the cake that my father made for the bicentennial. This cake was not in our house. Because had it been, my brother and I would try to eat it. In high school, my brother played football. I was with the cheerleaders. <laughs> they don't smell and sweat like a football player. <laughs> I didn't want to go play with them. I wanted to stay with the cheerleaders. At graduation, my brother was named All-State Tackle. He was the number one tackle football player in the state of Alaska. You didn't want to mess with my brother, and you didn't want to mess with me. Because if you did, my brother would eat you. <laughs> After graduation, my brother wasn't on the track anymore. He wasn't working out anymore. There was no more glory on the football field, but he kept eating the junk food that we had learned to eat. A number of years later, he got married, and him and his wife kept eating. And I got a photograph of them one Christmas. Both of them weigh over 300 kilos apiece. She died at 306 kilos. <clears throat> if you would have told her as a teenager, you're going to weigh 300 kilos as an adult, she would have said never. But she did. I don't want that to happen to anybody here in this room. And it doesn't have to happen. You may say, well, Paul, you just got good genes. You just got lucky. I said, no, I got, I got a bad hand. My mother and my father and both of their parents were on heart and blood pressure medicine by the time they were 35 years old. I am the only one in my family that is not on heart and blood pressure medication. My grandfather died weighing 160 kilos. My dad topped out at 280 pounds. What is that? 140 kilos. Now, my grandfather weighed 320 pounds. That's 160 kilos, isn't it? Yeah. All right. All of my family is big. If you look at a family portrait, they point to me and say, was he adopted? because I don't look like any of the rest of them. I was born a butterball. I weighed eight and a half pounds. I was a short, fat baby. Yes. But as soon as I learned to walk, it started to go away. And then I learned how to take care of myself. So we'll spend some time this afternoon to touch down on this a little bit. Proverbs has a lot to say about your health. You know that, don't you? The wisest man who ever lived said a number of things that I think are important to us as Christians. Proverbs 13, 25 tells us to eat to the satisfying of our soul. You know, most people eat to the satisfying of their tongue. Now, I want to tell you something. There are no brains in here. The brains are on top for a reason. They are to control everything else underneath. Anything under your brain 
has control, you may be destroyed. You are not allowed the tongue to make the choice. The brain is to make the choice. So that's why he said, eat to the satisfying of your what? Soul, not your tongue. Solomon also said in Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. You want to have a longer life? You want to have a better life? You guard your mouth. Proverbs 13, excuse me, Proverbs 21, 23, he who guards his mouth guards his soul. So your mouth is not only going to guard your life, it's going to guard what? Your soul. That was Proverbs 21, 23. And the last one, Proverbs 18, 21, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. There it is. Death and life right here. You can't let it be in control. Because the tongue has two primary functions, to talk and to taste. That's its two primary functions. And death and life are in the words that you will speak. Death and life are in the food that you're going to eat. Watch the tongue, because this is where death and life is, not only for you, but everyone around you. So the mind must have control here. There are a couple of statements from Ellen White. I want to read you, and I believe in her. I want to profit from the prophet. If you don't, you will lose. <laughs> profit from the prophet. Listen to these statements. Through inducing men to yield to his temptation, Satan can get control of them. How is he going to control you? To give in to his temptations. And through no class of temptation does he achieve greater success than those addressed to the appetite. Where's his greatest success? Appetite. You don't think so? Take a look in the mirror. See if he's been successful or not. If he can control the appetite, he can control the whole man. I don't need your eyes. I don't need your hands. I don't need your feet. I want that tongue. Because if I got that tongue, I got all of you. All of you comes with the tongue. That's my focus, is your tongue. I want that. Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. His strongest hold, his what? Strongest, strongest hold is through appetite. This he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. If this is his strongest hold, it should be my strongest attention, shouldn't it? It's not an option. This is serious. And he's going to try to stimulate you every way. Isn't that right? Why do you think there are new packages in the grocery store every year? Did we find a new tree to take food from? No, there's no new trees. All the food that we eat showed up 6,000 years ago. There's nothing new from God's hand. It's all right there. If we start eating away from the Garden of Eden, we may get into trouble. I don't have time to tell you all the science that's going on and all that ingredients that they're putting inside your food. You keep eating out of jars, boxes, and cans, you're going to feel and look like a jar, a box, or a can. All right? You know when your face doesn't look good? You know when you look tired? Satan has control. Now this next statement, I was so grateful to God that I found this when I was a very new Adventist because this statement helped to set the course of my life. And here it is, from Councils on Diets and Food, page 59. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. That got my attention. I don't want to be the thousands. Who, if they had conquered on the point of appetite, they would have moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation. Wow! Did you catch that? When I was a new Christian, I didn't know where to start with the temptations. The alcohol, the entertainment, the music. Where do I start? There are too many temptations. She told me right here where to start. It's like all of your temptations are a line of dominoes. How do you knock down all the dominoes? You hit the first one, don't you? And then the rest of them go. And she says right here, 
if you can get the victory over appetite, boom, the first domino goes down and you will have moral power for all of the other temptations. This is good. This is good. I'm going to pay attention here because I don't want to chase all the other temptations. I want to knock them down. I'm going to sit still, nail this appetite, and watch them go. And guess what? It did. It did. Because that appetite gave me a clear mind and moral power over all the other temptations. She continues, as we draw near the close of time, do you think we're there? Do you think we're near the end? Yes. Mm -hmm. She says, as we draw near the close of time, that means she's talking to us today. In 2017, she's talking to you and me right now. She says, Satan's temptation to indulge the appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to resist. Friend, it's not going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult because he's putting more packages on the shelf. Oh, look what I found in this factory. Oh, look what I found in this factory. Look what I found in this factory. Oh, it didn't come from a tree. It didn't come from the ground. No, this is not God's food. This is my food. This is mine. Here, eat it. Eat it. And I will get into your brain with all of these chemicals and all of these sprays and all of this stuff that I put in there. And you're mine. You're mine. You're going to go crazy. Yes. It's true. You're thinking, how am I going to get control of my appetite? And I think we find the answer in the first commandment. What does the first commandment say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I get up in the morning and would rather watch television instead of having time in my Bible, what may be my God? Could be that TV set. If I would rather sleep in and hurry off to work with no time in my Bible, what may be my God? Sleep or work. Yes. You see, God is a God of order, and there's a reason why the first commandment is the first commandment. He says, have no other gods before me. You spend time in my word and in prayer every morning with me, first thing, I will carry you through the next nine commandments. But if you break that first commandment, those nine commandments are going to come crashing on you all day long. That's why he made the first commandment first. Because by keeping the first commandment, you give him permission and the authority to carry you through the next nine commandments. Isn't that right? Keep that first commandment. It will keep you. You will then have the ability from God to follow through on the things he's asked you to do. At the end of last year, I was pondering three questions. The Lord gave me these questions. And as I looked at these questions, I said, these, these questions came from you, God, and they're very important. And I'm going to start teaching them. So you're one of the first groups to hear these questions. The first question, what two things are the most important things in your life? Question number two, what two things do you need more than anything else? Question number three, what two things must you accomplish before your life on earth is finished? Wow. Now, it would be nice to have a long time to think about these, but I'm going to give you some Bible answers to these questions. <clears throat> the first one, the two greatest needs that you have in your life. Those two needs, are number one, to receive love, and number two, to give love. Those will be the two greatest needs of your life. And you cannot give love until you have first received love. So let's take a look at 1 John 4.19. It's so clear. I like this text when I saw it. I knew what it meant. 1 John 4.19. We loved because he first loved us. There it is. 
He loved you, and now you can love. Okay? So those are your two greatest needs, to receive love and to give love. The two most important things in this world, and there's only two, the two most important things in this world are God and people. That's it. Everything else burns. You understand that? So the only two things that will survive the fire is God and people. Nothing else matters because it's all going to burn. That's very clear in 2 Peter 3.19. 2 Peter 3.19 says it's all going to burn up as ashes. So why would you invest your time and your money and your interest in something that's going to burn? Invest your time, your money, and your interest in the only two things that will survive the fire. And that's what? God and people, yes. And the last thing, two goals that you should achieve before you finish your time here on this earth. And the first goal is found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You know what it is, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Fruit of the Spirit, we want to see this in our lives so other people will see it in their lives. Is that right? So my number one goal is to have all nine fruit in my life, leading to the second thing that I want to accomplish, which is in um, Luke 19.10. Luke 19.10 says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. So with that fruit of my Holy Spirit in my life, I am going to seek and save that which is lost. Those are the only two things I want to accomplish in my life. Amen? Amen. What else is there? Nothing else matters. Just those two. I like those questions, and I thank the Lord that he gave me those questions. And now I'm traveling the world asking those three questions everywhere I go. Because I want you to think about that. You need to think about your priorities. What's important? Where are you going? Why are you doing this? Those three questions will answer those qu your, your life questions. You need to know this. There are some more questions in Genesis that I found very interesting. When Adam and Eve sinned, God asked them four questions. Did you know that? He asked them four questions as soon as they fell. When they went to hide, four questions. Let's just take a look. Genesis chapter 3. Because he's asking you and I those same four questions today. So we should know what the questions are to someone who sins, like Adam and Eve. And the first question is found in Genesis chapter 3. Right after the fall, Adam and Eve were hiding. And first question in Genesis 3, verse 9, God called to Adam and he said to him, here's the first question, what is it? Where are you? You know he's asking you that question today? Are you in the nightclubs? Are you in front of the TV set? Are you just in the internet all the time? Where are you? First question, where are you? Second question, and the third question is found in verse 11. And he said, who told you you were naked? And the third question, have you eaten the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Who told you? God is asking you today. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to the rock and roll and they're teaching you? Are you listening to teachers who are teaching error? Are you listening to pornography? What are you listening to? God wants to know what you're listening to. Because by what you listen to, it will affect your mind. And it will affect where you're going. The fourth question, verse 13. What is this you have done? What have you done? And you see, because of the first three questions, it will determine the fourth. Where are you? Who are you listening to? I missed one, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. In verse 11, who told you you were naked and have you eaten? Yeah. Oh, yes. God says, I want to know what you're eating. Because what you're eating is going to result in the answer of the fourth question. Where you are, what you're listening to, what you're eating will determine what you have done. Is that right? Yes. 
Pay attention to these because Satan is paying attention and he's setting everything up for him, not for God. So be careful where you are, who you're listening to, what you're eating, because it will determine what you've done. I'm going to close with this last story, and then a quick comment on this. <clears throat> a number of years ago when I was in Anchorage, they asked me to plan the New Year's Eve party for the church. We had a big church, about four or 500 members. And they said, Paul, please plan the New Year's Eve party, because we know that if you plan it, it's going to be very spiritual. And so I said, all right. So I prayed about this and prepared for it. And we made an announcement to the church that everyone coming to the New Year's Eve party should plan on sharing three blessings that occurred in their life this year and three challenges that occurred in their life. Because we can learn from each other, can't we? Yes. I want to know what your blessings were and how you got them, and I want to know what your challenges were and how you got over them. So you had to come, three blessings, three challenges. I was excited. This is going to be good. You learn so much about your brothers and sisters when you find these out. But too often, we don't really know each other, do we? Yeah. When we leave the church, we ask how we are, and we give them a four-letter word. Fine. Good. OK. Oh, don't talk to me in four-letter words. I don't like four-letter words. You tell me how you are. Don't tell me you're fine. Don't tell me you're good. You're OK. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I used to pastor. I know what's going on in your houses. It's not fine. It's not good. It's not OK. You need help. You need encouragement. And that's what we're here for, not to pretend fine, good, OK. Mm, thou shalt not bear false witness. Remember that commandment? Mm -hmm. So I was planning the New Year's Eve party. And about a week before the New Year's Eve party, I believe in Joel chapter 2, by the way. In Joel chapter 2, it says, in the last days, when? In the last days, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And about a week before the New Year's Eve party, I had this amazing dream. I saw my guardian angel walking toward me with a book that had 365 pages. I knew what it was. It was the new year, my book of life. And as he walked toward me with that, and he opened it up, oh, the pages were beautiful, white, pure, clean. And I looked at that and I said, uh, no, don't, don't give the book to me. I will only get it dirty with my sins, my thoughts, my actions. And my guardian angel said, I'm not going to give you the book. You don't get the book. But I am going to give you one page at a time, not the whole book. You'll be given one page. Write carefully on that page because you may not be given another one. And at the end of the day, you ask for God's forgiveness, and that page will go back into the book of life as pure and as clean as when I gave it to you that morning. But don't forget to ask Jesus to cleanse you so that your book of life is clean and pure. Yes. My friend, you'll only be given one page each day. Write carefully on that page. Nobody is promised the next page. And at the end of the day, be certain that that page is as clean and pure as when it was given to you that morning. Amen? Amen. In closing, I told you I would get back to my baptismal certificate. The reason that I'm here in Holland is because of number nine of my promises. Number nine states, I believe in the soon coming of Jesus as the blessed hope. And it is my settled determination to prepare to meet him in peace, as well as to help others to get ready for that glorious appearing. I am determined to meet my God in peace. And I'm just as determined to help you also. And if you will allow me that privilege and that honor, this afternoon we will step a little closer to getting ready for that second coming. Amen. Amen.